Dr. Forbes, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. And now, please let me welcome our ne next guest, next speaker, who's Dr. Chantal Ryan from Brock University, Ontario, Canada. Welcome. Awesome. So hi, everybody. My name is Chantal Ryan. I am from Brock University, which is located in Ontario, Canada. And I am here today presenting um, an article that I was uh, one of the authors on that was recently published in this uh, special editions of nutrients called creatine monohydrate supplementation increases white adipose tissue mitochondrial markers in male and female rats in a depot specific manner. Okay, so to begin off to begin this presentation, I did just want to give a little bit of background info on adipose tissue and how diverse it really is. Most of us, when we think about fat, we picture what is actually known as white adipose tissue. So white adipose tissue, which you may hear me refer to as what through habit, <laughs> is a store for excess energy, energy. Therefore, it is not a very metabolically active tissue. Phenotypically, when we're talking about white, ad white adipocytes, they're, they're unilocular, meaning that there's one large centralized lipid droplet in the center of the cell, which pushes organelles to the perimeter of the cell. What people typically don't think of when we think about fat is brown adipose tissue, which I may refer to as BAT. So brown adipose tissue is a more metabolically inefficient type of fat, and this is due to greater levels of mitochondria and uncoupling protein 1, which is known as UCP1. So UCP1 functions through uncoupling the electron transport chain, which means that more energy is required to produce each molecule of ATP. ATP. Uh, so phenotypically, BAT is multilocular, meaning that there are multiple smaller lipid droplets within each adipocyte, allowing for greater surface area for organelles to exist within. What's interesting is there's actually a third form of adipose known as beige adipose tissue. If the metabolic activity of white and brown adipose tissue was a part of a co continuum, beige, adip sorry, beige adipose tissue would lie somewhere in the middle between the two. This is because it's more metabolically active than white adipose tissue, although it's not as robust as brown adipose tissue. Beige adipose has some multilocular cells, but some adipocytes still remain unilocular. So getting into creatine and how this relates to adipose tissue, um, there's been a lot of metabolic research that's taken place um, in inducing thermogenesis within thermogenically latent white adipose tissue in, a, in an attempt to have it more closely resemble the biochemical properties of brown adipose tissue. A lot of this research has been centered around UCP1 dependent mechanisms, such as cold exposure and exercise. However, uh, a couple of researchers, Kazik and Spiegelman, and some of their colleagues discovered that uh, UCP1 independent thermogenesis may exist within adipose tissue through a mechanism of creatine futile cycling. As represented in the pathway above, uh, which is created by one of his students' son, uh, the proposed pathway is that creatine kinase B phosphorylates creatine into phosphocreatine, uh, and this process converts one molecule of AT ATP into ADP. But then we have TNAP, which will dephosphorylate phosphocreatine back into creatine, creatine which then causes the cycle to become futile. So naturally, this led us into wanting to examine if creatine supplementation exhibited any effects on mitochondrial markers that are commonly associated with white adipose tissue browning, where white adipose tissue browning is really a process of, you know, increasing the thermogenicity of a tissue. Um, it's where we're activating that beige, those beige adipocytes in what is typically considered a white, adip like a white adipose depot. So for our... Um, like to examine our research question, we had 32 Sprague Dolly rats, 16 were male, 16 were female. And at the beginning of the study, they were 12 weeks of age. We had divided them up into four groups. So we had our control group, and then we had a group that had access to 2.5 grams, as well as five grams and 10 grams of creatine per liter in drinking water, uh, which the mice had access to ad libitum for eight weeks. At the end of the feeding period, white adipose samples were collected from the inguinal depot, which was representative of a subcutaneous adipose depot, from the gonadal depot, which is representative of a visceral adipose depot, and from, or sorry, our brown sample was collected from the interscapular depot. So our samples underwent protein quantification as well as some histological analysis. 
So I'm going to start by diving into our results, um, which is from our inguinal white adipose uh, tissue, which is our subcutaneous adipose tissue results. So in figure A on the left, you can see that overall females appear to have slightly lower levels of mitochondrial markers that are associated with thermogenesis than males. Uh, when we look at figure B, however, uh, we can see that creatine supplementation actually has the potential to increase the presence of these markers, such as PDH E1 alpha. Uh, we saw increases at a dose as low as two grams per liter of creatine via the drinking water. And we also saw increases in other mitochondrial proteins such as COX-4 and cytochrome C. And none of these same changes were observed in the subcutaneous tissue of male rats. It was only the females. Moreover, creatine appeared to have no effect on UCP1 levels, which could be indicative of the UCP1 independent thermogenesis that we are hoping to achieve through creatine supplementation. This is a possibility as we are starting to see increases in some of these mitochondrial proteins that are commonly associated with increased thermogenesis but without seeing that rise in UCP1. So regarding morphology of the tissue, histological analysis overturned no significant findings in the inguinal white depot in both male and female adipocyte, adipocyte size, as well as the percentage of multilocular cells. So moving into our visceral results, so our gonadal white adipose tissue, we see that females are appearing to have a lower presence of PGC1 alpha than males. Um, and with regards to the mitochondrial markers, it appears that the males are the ones exhibiting these results in the visceral depot, the gonadal adipose tissue, as we can see represented with an increase of COX-4. Uh, the females are appearing to be rather unaffected in this visceral gonadal depot, which is opposite to what we saw in the subcutaneous depot. Then going forwards with the histological results in the visceral depot, we see that the females were showing no multilocular adipocytes in the control group, whereas about 5% of the male adipocytes were multilocular. So a little bit of a base, potential baseline difference there. Although creatine supplementation did not appear to have any effects on the adipocyte era, area or percentage of multilocular cells in the sample again. Next, we wanted to look at some creatine specific markers. So one that we looked at is GAMT. So GAMT is a catalyst enzyme, which is responsible for mediating intrinsic creatine synthesis. Our results in the current study depicted no differences in GAMT content despite creatine supplementation at any dose. Additionally, we took a quick look at creatine kinase B, which, an, which was analyzed as a marker of uh, creatine cycling, if we remember back to that futile cycling slide I was showing at the beginning. So creatine kinase B displayed increases in the female IWAT at the five gram per liter mark. However, the significance was not maintained at the 10 grams per liter group of creatine. Lastly here, we wanted to look at a marker of creatine transport. So that is SLC6A8 expression. Um, we determined, we, we analyzed it through real-time real qPCR. Interestingly, we found that SLC6A8 was increased in the male IWAT and increased in female GWAT. So these results are actually opposite of our findings with the mitochondrial markers, where we saw increases in the female IWAT and the male GWAT. On the right in figure D, you can see that we did also measure creatine content within the tissues. IWAT displayed an increased tissue concentration of creatine as supplementation increased, which would have been expected. So, to begin kind of summarizing and wrapping up what we did find in this pilot study was that we learned from this study that male and female white adipose tissue has depot specific and sex specific responses to creatine. As you can see, I did sum it up uh, briefly here on the bottom of the slide. The study also highlights the importance of including sex specific analysis into studies as how one sex may respond to a stimulus is not necessarily the same among the opposite sex. But further investigation is needed to determine the molecular mechanisms underlying the creatine-induced mitochondrial changes observed in the study, 
and how this regulation is specific to each, each adipose depot in both sexes. Before I wrap up the presentation, I did want to touch on how we saw the SLC6A8 gene increase in the female GWAT and in the male IWAT, which as you can see on the screen above is opposite to the sex specific responses for the mitochondrial markers. So we looked at this and at first we were a little puzzled. We kind of scratched our heads a little bit. <laughs> what we came up with though, is we did end up hypothesizing that the SLC6A8 gene may be upregulated in female GWAT. So the gonadal white adipose tissue and upregulated in the male inguinal white adipose tissue depots in an attempt to produce equal physiological responses among adipose depots within the same rat. However, this is purely speculative. So further studies are definitely needed to either confirm or deny that. Overall, our study has shown us that there is a potential for creatine to initiate UCP1 independent thermogenesis in adipose tissue. However, future work is needed to understand how like to understand how the changes that we see in the mitochondrial proteins will affect functional measures such as oxygen consumption, metabolic rate, etc. Yeah. So there are just some quick references. I do want to give a quick shout out to uh, my colleagues, my coworkers, my lab mates who have, you know, worked tirelessly and endlessly alongside me to produce some really awesome results. I appreciate you all more than you know. Thank you for coming to my talk. <laughs>